Uh, all right, guys, welcome in for this week's uh, Bible study, and thanks to all of you that are here in the room and others that are listening uh, around the country and, and in some cases even around the world through the technology of podcasts and, and also on our YouTube channel and, uh, uh, and just uh, on our uh, SoundCloud and soon to be Omni. We'll do a little switch there, but that shouldn't affect anybody. Um, or if you're some of the people my age in the room that uh, are not with us today, but I have to text it to you every week. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, <laughs> Thank you guys for being here with us today. We are going to finish the book of James today. We'll finish in James chapter 5. That'll wrap up the book of James. And then next week, um, I think I'm going to go ahead and do the introduction to what we're going to do next because our turnover in here is not all that big. Uh, Man Church is coming up on the 27th of January. For those of you that can be in town, uh, that is, uh, there's no ticket you have to buy or anything like that at 6 o'clock. On the 27th, Patrick Nix will be our speaker. Uh, he'll be challenging us, and then we'll go from that into the next round of Bible studies. Uh, this Bible study will continue on like it always has, but we will be going into Steve Farrar's book, Finishing Strong. We're going to kind of, we've gone through three books of the Bible. We're going to go and try to do some application with this very convicting book about what it looks like uh, for, uh, for us to actually do what needs to be done to actually finish strong. Uh, and, uh, and I'll do an introduction to that book coming up next Wednesday and kind of what we're going to be covering, and then we'll do Man Church on the 27th, and then after that we'll roll right into uh, that book. You can get that book on Amazon if you'd like. If you don't want to get a copy of the book, that's fine. I hope Steve Farrar's not listening to this uh, because we will walk through that. Also, some things you want to do here among the family. Uh, I know that, uh, that Greg Burgess, who watches, uh, you know, we, we do sell some, uh, some of our boxes over here to watch the Bible study. And Greg, uh, when we uh, when we get a crowd, is that Greg is a, a first time granddaddy? We had a, a new Burgess come into the world uh, on uh, on Friday, uh, born in Atlanta, Ellis William Burgess, uh, seven pounds ten ounces and twenty inches long. Uh, so Greg, congratulations, uh, a new granddaddy, and what a great celebration that was. It was so funny to watch this young couple that that look on their face, a weird combination of joy and fear. Uh, so it, it, it was great to, to see that. Let's, let's open up in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for today. Uh, Lord, be with us as we unpack uh, this, this incredibly convicting uh, chapter of the Bible through, through James. And Lord, I pray we take it today and apply it to ourselves, Lord, that, that the first thing we always uh, have on our minds when we come into any type, any type of Bible study where we unpack your word is how does this apply to me and that we lose the attitude of how it is applying to someone else that I wish was here. Uh, how about we apply it to ourselves, those of us who are actually here, and have the, the proper attitude as we're working out our salvation with fear and trembling, or maybe we, we're unsure about our salvation, that maybe today we solidify the most important decision that we'll ever make. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so, so James is going to wrap it up, and he's going he's to start out in James chapter 5. and he's gonna, he, Now keep in mind, don't lose sight of what the book of James is all about. This is James, who's, who's pastoring, what we would say, uh, the, the first Christian church in Jerusalem. And so this letter is not written to the lost. Now, everything in the Bible applies to the lost, but, but what he's talking about is what's going on in his uh, congregation, in this group of believers. And if you remember, if you were with us last week, or you've had a chance to listen to that last week, he was unpacking the fact that he said many of you are, are, you're, you're an adulterous people, meaning inside this congregation, we have people who have declared that you're under the authority of Christ, but you are unfaithful to Christ, and you've committed spiritual adultery against Christ because of the open sin that's in the church. So what you need to do is reconcile yourself back under the authority of Christ, and we talked about that, and resist the devil, meaning to, to totally submit to Christ, must include rejecting his arch enemy as well, and we, 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 we did the very convicting analogy, or at least it was for me, that if your wife came to you, or if you're listening and you are a married woman on uh, some of our, our social media platforms, if it was your husband, and he came back to you and said, I'm ready to reconcile, so I'm only going to see this other person every now and then. That, that, that would not be complete reconciliation. If they said, I'm going to stop cheating on you as much, uh, that, that is not reconciliation. So, uh, so he takes that on. Well, now he wants to first start off in chapter 5 talking about the wealthy people that are there in the church. Now, first of all, we have to be crystal clear. Don't let anybody teach you anything otherwise. There's nothing sinful in and of itself about being wealthy. Uh, and, and we know that because the Bible teaches us that. We know that Abraham 
was incredibly wealthy, and it talks about how he walked with God and how God promised that he would bless the nations through Abraham. And, and of course, Abraham was justified by faith just like the rest of us, but he was an extremely wealthy person. Uh, we know that Job was, we're going to talk about Job today because uh, James does, but we, Job's was a man of incredible wealth, and it said that he was, you know, that he was upright, he was beyond reproach, that he was the, the example compared to the other people, and that, and that God took him through testing, and then after the testing was done, he restored even more wealth to him. So there, there, there's no indicator of whether someone is lost or someone is in sin based on their wealth. What he wants to talk about is how did you get the wealth? Is that sinful? What are you doing with the wealth? And do you have a sinful attitude about your wealth? And that is where, you know, because, look, we, we, we learned this in the Dallas Willard Bible study we did here. If you were with us here and he took on a, a, a truth, some of, some of the most wicked people I've ever encountered are poor. And, and, and I've, I've encountered wicked people that are rich, and I've encountered wicked people that are somewhere in between. Because, and there are some people that, that love money more than th that I've ever met that don't have any. But all they ever care about is somehow getting it. Playing that lottery, gambling, what just anything they can do to somehow get rich. So it's the wealth in and of itself is not the problem. It's it's how it was acquired, and he's going to talk about some things uh, about what they're doing. So let's let's read the first few uh, verses here, and we'll unpack this. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Look at verse two. Your riches have rotted, and your garments are moth eaten. Your gold and silver silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasures in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mow your fields, which you have kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. Don't miss that. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have, you have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Okay, so once again, James doesn't beat around the bush. No, it's just not, that's not the way God made him. He does not go the long way home. And so let's unpack some of the, the first part of what James is addressing is that, that he's addressing the rich men in the church. And again, we've already established riches in and of itself were not sinful. It, it's, it's how they were using their wealth for selfish purposes and were persecuting the poor in the process. And again, James is not saying it was a sin to be rich. And we talked about Abraham and Job. James is concerned, James is concerned about the selfishness of the rich and advised them to weep and to howl. So he, he, he says, all of you that are wealthy in this congregation, and he's going to talk about why, you don't need to be so full of yourself because of your wealth. What you really should be doing is weeping and howling about the state that, you are, that we now find you, and, and you really don't have anything to be proud of. As a matter of fact, you should be ashamed of the way that you are living. And then he starts talking about, through various verses, and I, I put it down in three categories, on the problem with these particular rich people. First of all, he said you're holding back wages. Uh, Deuteronomy 24, 14, and 15, if you have that, uh, or have something with your Bible on or you want to make some notes, make that one. Deuteronomy 24, 14, and 15, here's what God had to say about the very thing that he's talking about. He says, You shall not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy, whether he is one of your brothers or one of the sojourners, who are in your land within your towns. You shall give him his wages on the same day before the sun sets, for he's poor and he's counting on it, lest he cry out against you to the Lord and you be guilty of sin. This is exactly what James is talking about because he, he, he talks about that. He says uh, I, I, there's a real problem because in these days God had given definite instructions concerning the laboring men and why? He was protecting them from oppressive employers. Hey, there weren't any unions during this time. You know, you were pretty much at the mercy of an employer or whoever you were working for. So God said, if you claim to be one of mine and you're an employer, I'm going to be very specific about the way I expect you to, to treat the people who are working for you. And one thing I don't want you to do is to promise them they're going to be paid something, then you not pay them either at all or in a timely manner. Don't tell the guy he's got a check on Friday 
And then he's sitting there all week going, telling his wife that he's going to have money on Friday. And all of a sudden you go, well, I, I didn't get around to that today. I'll, I'll, I'll pay you. I'll try to pay you by Tuesday. He said, he's not rich like you. He was waiting on that check on the day you said to give it to him. And what he's really talking about here, some of these men were, were letting people work and not paying them at all. They, they, they were keeping it for themselves. Jeremiah 22, 13. Woe to the man that buildeth his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by wrong that uses his neighbor's service without wages and gives him nothing for his work. So Jeremiah, and if you remember, who was Jeremiah talking to? God's people. And, and God loved him. He, he never got to say anything positive. And, uh, and, and so, you know, once again, here is James talking to a group of mainly, that we do know that there's some Gentiles in this congregation now, but he's, he's talking to them. These are instructions that God gave us, and you're God's people. You should know this. And he's calling them out. He said, these rich men were hiring labor, promising to pay them a specific amount, and they were either not paying them what they said they would pay them, or, or, or they're not paying them at all. As a matter of fact, if you look at the word in the original Greek that you hear James talk about, you're, you're keeping the money back, you're holding it back, this is where it goes further. If you look at the original Greek word, I looked at some of the commentary, it really meant they weren't just keeping some for themselves or shortchanging them. They weren't paying them at all. And you know what they say after the guys finish the work? What are you going to do about it? It's, I've got what I wanted, and you have no recourse against me. And so he's saying, you guys are coming in here to the church, and you guys are wealthy, and you're employing people, and you're treating them like garbage, and you know what? You should be weeping, and you should be howling, and you should be begging God for mercy for the way you're treating the people who work for you. And I will tell you, I don't know how many people in here have people that, that, that work for them. There's nothing that makes me sicker than, and, and, and you see how God's anger burns against these people, is for people who claim to be you know, Christians and followers of Christ, and they're some of the worst employers you'd ever want to work for. They're, they're constantly, they're, you know, they're constantly trying to keep the employers down. They, 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 they don't, they don't serve those that they're in charge of. They're always trying to cheat people out of something. They're cheap in general, you know. They, they don't want to pay people a living wage. They're always out to shortchange people that work for them, and then they roll up and go to church on Sunday as if they're some great person. You know, one of the things you want to hear about a man of God, if people work for you then the thing you want to hear is that when they work for you, they actually see Jesus in you. They're not confused when you tell them what church you go to. You go to church by the way you treat us? And, and so that's exactly what James is talking about. The next thing he talked about, and this kind of goes back to a little bit from before. He says, if you read on, they're controlling the courts. You know, you guys are, now the laborers get mad at you and they try to take you before the judge, but you've got money, so you've already bought the judge. You're paying off the courts. And this was happening a lot in, in Jerusalem at that time. And, and James was taking this on with his own congregation. And, and it, one of the things I saw, if, I don't know if you remember the old cartoon. It was in a comic strip, and I can't remember which one it was. And, and it was talking, one guy's talking to the other guy. He says, are you familiar with the golden rule? And he said, yes, I am. Whoever has the gold makes the rules. <laughs> and so that's exactly what was going on is anytime somebody rose up and said, we got, where's our recourse? We're going to take this employer before the court. Well, that employer in, in the church, these men of the church that were wealthy, they just go pay the judge out. And so he says this was going on too, and, and the courts were very easy to control if you had money. And if you look back, and you remember when he talked about in, in, in chapter 4, verse 2, when he's angry what's going on, when he talked about, you know, whenever somebody comes against you, he's talking about murder and killing. He said, really, the, the, some of the commentators said James was, may have been referring to this very thing in chapter 4 too because if you wanted to destroy somebody, you know, you go in there pay the right judge off, take them for the judge. The judge not only would not rule in their favor, the judge would put them in jail. I mean, you could just destroy anybody you wanted to uh, if you had the, the, the court under your uh, control by paying off people. And uh, he says, so, so not only... Uh, where the laborers, you know, getting mistreated because you're now going and paying the only recourse that they have, they got no way to come against you. But I got news for you. It's not getting past God. You may be paying off the course, but you've not paid off the ultimate judge, and that is your creator, and that's your father, and that's your Lord, and that's your Savior. You didn't pay them off. They see how you're behaving, which is why he's saying you should be howling and you should be weeping. He also addressed the way that they made their wealth. Not only did they make it in sinful ways, they used it uh, in sinful ways. The Bible, again, does not 
discourage, you know, saving or, or even investing, uh, but uh, but it also does condemn hoarding. And you can see, is there's look again. There's nothing wrong with planning. Nothing wrong with saving. We see the Bible telling us what that we should actually save some sort of inheritance to give to our children, and we should take care of our family. Anybody who does take care of their family, you know, is worse than a than, than a pagan. We all this is in the Bible. However, the Bible says it is a problem though if you're not saving money, you're hoarding it. Meaning you've got enough. You've got enough to save, and it, you're just you're just pot. You remember the, the the when Jesus talked about. The guy who just kept putting all the, he had so much stuff, he put it in the storehouse. It, there was so much, it was going to ruin before he could ever use it. That's what he's speaking to. You men in this church have so much, you're beyond saving it, you're hoarding it, and there's needs everywhere, and you're not using the wealth that God gave you to help anybody. You're completely indulging yourself with it. No one in here, if you look at verse 4, you're keeping others from benefiting from your wealth. I've got news for you. Hey, look, all of us that have been that, that have been been given much. Think think about what the Bible says. You know how we always try to dumb the Bible down to make it more palatable. I used to say that that God said, "Too much is given, much is hoped." Like God's ever going, I hope He does something good with it. No, what the Bible says is, "Too much I, to those I've given much, much is required, not not expected, not hoped for, required." That's the proper interpretation. It's required. Meaning that if I've given you much, I expect you to do much with it to advance the kingdom. And, and I'm not saying that you can't live comfortably. I'm not saying you can't take care, care of your family. But I, do not, I didn't give it to you for you to be a glutton with it and to, and to hoard it. And, and when there's, there's – guys, we, we are even members of a church, those of us in here that are a member of the same church. Do you all realize there shouldn't be one thing, not one thing, that the church where we live and the amount of wealth we live in, there shouldn't be one thing that our church ever brings up that is not met immediately. Not one. There's more than enough money to meet everything that comes across the church's desk. But, man, sometimes I feel like we're up there begging for it. You know what it ought to be? Handled. Now, our church does well. I'm not downing it. But there should never be a need that the churches in, in the wealthy part of town can't meet. Not one. And, uh, you know, I, I remember one time, I, and it was certainly fine because you want the youth to get involved, but I can remember one time we were passing a hat for a missionary that needed a computer. I said, for the love of God, give, give, give them a computer. <laughs> we're, we're asking the youth to, raise the, to, to try to find a dollar and put it in his hat. How much is a computer? Give the, give the missionary a computer. My gosh, bring it over here. How much do y'all need it for a computer? I mean, get it done. You know, and, uh, you know, uh, hey, he doesn't, have, he, he doesn't have any transportation. My God, can we get him a car? How much is it to get a car? He's not, he don't want a new one. You know, wherever he's serving in a third world country, we can find him a nice car for five grand. Can we not get him a car? You know, that's what he's talking about. God has given you more than enough to take care of the needs of the people in our community, and you're hoarding it for yourself. Verse 5, he talks about what? They were living in luxury. Certain, certain nothing wrong with having some stuff, as long as you have it in the proper place. Paul said, if you got possessions... Just have an open hand with them, meaning you don't care whether you have them or not. It doesn't define you. Like we said today, if you ever want to know if your kid is too indulgent in their smartphone and their tablet, if you take it away from them and they act like you've taken away oxygen, you probably want to fix that. They're probably hanging on too tight. If you've got any possession that means that much to you, it's a problem. Any possession. Nothing wrong with having it. But if you care whether you have it or not, it's probably a problem. If you think you're fulfilled by it, I mean, how about this? It's like Paul talked about. Paul said what in Philippians? He said, I've, I, I've had a lot. I've had a little. I've had somewhere in between. And what I've learned in Christ is be content, content wherever I'm at. If I have stuff, thank you, Lord. If I don't have it, thank you, Lord. Uh, you know, and remember this. And this is something I had to learn in my own life because I'd never, I'd, you know, I, did, I came up, you know, very average uh, never, I didn't know we didn't have a lot of stuff, you know, until I got older and said, oh, so people had stuff. I didn't, I didn't even, not only did we not have a lot of stuff, I didn't know about who did. So I didn't, I didn't compare myself to anybody. We all were the same. And, uh, but, but what I remember is this, and, th and this is important. Sometimes the very thing that we call a blessing is a distraction. It's not a blessing at all. I'll tell you what I'm working on right now. And, and, and I can't wait to get there, simplifying my life. 
hey, I, got, I, I bought something else. And what comes with that? A bunch, of, a bunch of handles, a bunch of hassles. You know, I'm thankful for it. I don't want to be disrespectful about it. But, you know, every new thing you got, before you know it, it's got to be fixed. Hey, something's going on over here. If you got down to so-and-so, hey, when's the last time you went down? You know, I, I can remember when life was a lot simpler, and I was a lot more effective when it was a lot more sim simpler. And I remember it, we, we kind of had to make a commitment after we got, got ahead. How about this? Why don't we just start doing and having less? We certainly are not, you know, some paupers. We're living in a luxurious life, and there's nothing wrong with living in luxury. Compared to the rest of the world, everybody in this room is living in luxury. I, I mean, the lowest person in this room on the economic scale is living in massive luxury compared to the rest of the world. And what he's saying is this. There's nothing wrong with, with, with living in luxury unless it's a type of luxury that has become wasteful. Wasteful and gluttonous. You know, everybody always talks about, and certainly I came into conviction about this, about being gluttonous about food, and I've struggled with that and finally quit justifying it and dealt with it. But, you know, gluttony goes beyond food. It's certainly part of it, but it goes beyond that. It's wasteful. Just like we look at, say, well, you're eating so much, you're gorging yourself, and, and there was plenty for everybody else, and you're just gorging, gorging, gorging to the point there's food laying everywhere, and you had to throw it away. And nobody, remember your mama saying there's people who could have used that food? Well, this is the same thing when it talks about the type of luxury these men were living. He goes, you, you guys are wealthy, and there's certainly nothing wrong with being wealthy. That in and of itself is not sinful. But look how gluttonous you are. You've taken luxury to a place. Hey, how many cars do you need? How many? How many houses do you need? How many boats do you need? How many guns do you need? Well, might need more of those. But anyway, but 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 I mean, I was talking about hunting and fishing. But 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 what but what I'm saying? Uh, well, I mean, you got you got to know what the times you're living in. But 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 what I'm saying is this: when you get to the point that you know, why are you not content yet? Why 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 is it always got to be more? Why is it never enough? And he says, if that's the attitude, it's probably a sinful attitude in the way that you're treating. Your wealth. He goes on to, to go beyond that. He says, remember in Luke 12, 15, uh, 12, 15 he said, also what? You're, you're, you're becoming self-indulgent, and this stuff's not going to mean anything, Jesus said in Luke 12, 15. He says, beware and be on guard against every form of greed. For even when one has abandoned, I mean, has abundance in this life, and his life consists of his possessions, he says, it's not going to mean anything in eternity. He said, every form of grace, he said, he says, so not even when one has abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Jesus, Jesus said, you can have all the stuff you want to on earth. When you die, these possessions won't define you at all. Your life does not consist of your possessions because they're not going to mean anything when you stand before me and I separate the sheep from the goats. If you read Matthew 25, he said, here's the things I'm going to be looking for. What did you do with it? I'm not going to be impressed with your house. That won't define you. I'm going to be impressed with what did you do with your house? Did, did, did you host people? Did you help people? Did, 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 what did you do with it? I'm not going to be, you're not going to impress the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and before Abraham, I am. What are, you going to do to, what are you going to do to impress the beginning and the end? Nothing. You know, Job got that resume. And Job felt real silly for, for a minute to think, you know, I love when Job tries to interrupt him about halfway and God said, I'm not finished. I'm going to tell you everything about me. Who, who are you to grumble against me? Hey, you're not going to impress God. What God is going to be impressed with is what did you do with the grace and the mercy and the things I afforded you? What would you do with them? Did, did I get a return to much for those who much is given, much is required on what I allowed you? Your platform, your vocation, your money, your things. And if you're just hoarding them to try to create heaven on earth, that is likely a sinful attitude. And then James clarifies on what these riches will do, and we've hit on that a little bit. In verses 2 and 3, he says the riches are going to vanish. Paul wrote this to Timothy, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or fix hope on the uncertainty of riches. That, this is Paul writing to Timothy. He said, hey, one thing you want to cover when I, when I, when I hand the ministry over to you since you're going to be one of my pastors, hey, in Ephesus, I want you to be clear. Let the rich people know not to get too full of themselves 
about what they have and for the love of all that's good and kind, not to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches because I can take it away just like that. I mean, I, we, I think about it all the time. You do realize that as, as quick or as slow as it might have happened, it, it kind of goes into this, what I say about when I try to wor worry about my physical health. You know, I found that it is so much easier to, to completely go downhill on my weight and on my health, and it takes so much longer to try to get ahead of it. You know, you have things like fractured hips. I mean, but you know, I mean, you, you, I mean, it, it, ta it takes such, a, it takes such a long time of just trying to get this body to come under the. But I tell you one thing: if you decide to let yourself go, it goes away quick. And so what he's saying is, I know it may have taken you a lot of time and hard work to acquire wealth, but you can lose it like that. If you don't believe that, then go go back to just two thousand eight. There are a lot of people that woke up wealthy and went to bed poor when everything's tied up in the market and tied up into real estate and tied up in the housing market. I mean, it, it can be gone just like this. So what Paul says, hey, Timothy, tell the rich people that better not be where their hope is found. The hope better be found in something a little more certain like my promises, my covenant, my grace, my forgiveness. And so... James lets him know that uh, don't let it define them because these things are going to vanish. This other thing he talked about, he said the misuse of riches will erode character there in verse 3. You know, and of course we know that Paul also wrote to Timothy about the, you know, the, uh, how money and the, it can be the root of all evil, the desire for money. Money is an evil in and of itself. As a matter of fact, you know this currency is neutral. There's nothing evil about currency. But what is evil is the love of money and, and how, how the desire you'll do anything for money. 1 Timothy 6.10 is where Paul talks about this. But this is what James said, and we'll finish on riches, which I thought was really, really good. James said that the, 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 rich, the riches they had saved, and what they'd done is they tried to save it and hoard it because they were scared or else they were just prideful or they were gluttonous. They were saving their wealth to help themselves. But ironically, when he starts talking about the day of judgment, James tells them, this same wealth that you've worked so hard to keep and you've hoarded for yourself will be used against you on the day of judgment. Well, you know what you've done? You, you basically have hung on to something that's detrimental to you on judgment day. Because Jesus talks about, look, there's nothing wrong with wealthy. He said, the problem I, that the wealthy is they don't think they need me. So they really have a hard time most of their lives in their relationship with me. Now, they don't have a hard time in the world because money can buy you out of a lot of trouble. He said, but the problem is their eternity. It really kind of gets in the way of them ever... Not that, not that none can do it. We, know, I, we mentioned some who did. He said, but really, they're hanging on to something that's one of the biggest obstacles they could ever have on Judgment Day. Now, keep in mind, James tells you pretty quick. He says, what the day of the Lord is at hand. All of, all of our heroes from the Bible, they didn't know any different. They thought that Jesus was going to come back before they died. He really thought that Jesus could come back at any moment. And he says, that's the reason why y'all need to deal with this right now. He said, this attitude, don't, hey, don't let the Lord show up and y'all haven't resolved this situation, all these things I've talked about concerning your wealth. Because if you do, the day he arrives, the very thing you just had to hang on to and you had to consume to the point of gluttony and luxury beyond something that is reasonable, this very thing you couldn't do without. Is going to be used against you. And that's something to remember on the return of Christ. Now, now we move on to, uh, to verse 7, and this is, um, this is the power of patience. James uh, 5, 7 through 12, let's read that. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Be patient about it until it receives the earth, the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Again, James really was felt strongly that they would see the coming of the Lord. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And as an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained stead fast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job. So there's Job. And you have seen the purpose of the Lord on how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, 
but let your yes be yes and your no be no that you so you may not fall under condemnation. Wow. So first of all, we see James using the analogy of the farmer, and they were all very familiar with that in this culture. He, and, and he says, you know, no crop is going to appear overnight. And I love this. I looked at one of the commentaries, and it was a nice commentary on this. James doesn't say it, but it's something to remember. And those of you that have been, you know, agriculture at all, you know this. Or even if your wife just has a flower garden, you know the only thing that grows overnight is what? Weeds. Now, they do pop up overnight. But he said the kind of crop that you're looking for is something you've got to be patient about. And he says, so, so these seeds, when they go into the ground, it takes some time. So, 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 be, so be patient about this. James pictures the Christian uh, as a spiritual farmer looking for a spiritual harvest. He said, be patient in your hearts. I love this. Here's what James is saying. The seed is the word of God, and the soil is our hearts. And God, that seed, the word of God goes as a seed into our heart. And then over time, God's producing a harvest in our lives. But see, he's warning us about trying to make this happen overnight. We, he's really talking about a mountaintop experience. You know, these are people that, that, you know, he talked about when Jesus does his parable. He said, some of y'all, it's going to be like the, 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 you know, the sower of the seeds. You're throwing the seeds out, and some of you are going to get real excited, but you got no roots. You, you're, you're trying to pull it all together and declare you got it all figured out overnight, and then y'all fade away. And James has given instruction. He said, really look to the prophets. You need to look to them. And he said about patience in, in, in verse 10. And he says, what an example from the prophets. He said, they were in the will of God and they suffered. So keep in mind, this is a persecuted church in Jerusalem. And he's saying, you know, y'all are waiting for the Lord to come get us. You're waiting for the suffering to end. You're waiting for the persecution to end. But you've got to take the mentality of a farmer. This isn't going to happen overnight. What you need to be thinking about is all the hardships you're having to go to with those seeds that are in the soil. And you're saying, why didn't it rain today? Now it's rained at the wrong time. You know, if you ever talk to farmers, I mean, they're at the mercy of the weather. And he says it can be very frustrating. He said, but what you have to understand is if you want that seed to be produced and you want a spiritual harvest, you're going to have to be patient and be patient even in your suffering. The Lord will deliver us, but it's not going to be overnight. And he said, now look, he said, look at the prophets. And he starts calling things that they knew. They were certainly in the will of God. They certainly were in the will of God, but they suffered greatly because they were, they were giving the messages from God to the people that the people didn't want, they didn't want to hear. They were preaching in the name of the Lord, and they were persecuted for doing so. 2 Timothy 3.12, we've talked about that a lot over the four years, and I want us to dial it in. 2 Timothy 3.12, Paul says to young Timothy, everybody, anyone who chooses to live a godly life, if you say, I'm going to stand with God, I'm going to be under His authority, I'm going to preach in the name of the Lord, I'm not going to compromise Jesus, he said, all those people, not some, will be persecuted. If you choose to live a godly life, you will be persecuted. Think about Jeremiah. Y'all have heard me tell you. Y'all know what I'm the old school guys in here say, oh, here he goes on Jeremiah. Because I'm going to tell you something. Jeremiah, you talk about somebody that had to wait on a harvest. I mean, I've, I've used this analogy because I've had the honor of being part of some, being on some boards for a ministry. And, and, you know, just like we had the state of the church last Sunday. You know, when people are tithing or people are giving, they want to know how it's going. What are y'all doing with our money? And, that, and that's fair. They, they, they should know. You know you know this. So you try to what? Show them what it's doing. Jeremiah never had any good news. None. Jeremiah, you know, we're supporting your ministry. We're all here at the board. like to hear how it's going. <laughs> Tell me how many people have listened to the word of the Lord. That'd be zero. <laughs> I got none. So tell me, tell me, have you won over the locals to earn the right to share? You're talking about the ones who put me in jail? who keep beating me and punching me and stoning me? Is that who you're talking about? I got no success. And he even gets to the point where he's put out with he's not seeing the success. Now think about what Jeremiah didn't know. He is being used by God to disciple us for generations. Now he didn't know that at the time. He thought he was supposed to see a turn by these people. And he finally gets to the point where he says, what? I'm out. I'm out. I don't want to talk about you anymore. I don't have any more patience. Every time I speak of you, it doesn't do anything but cause me trouble, which usually is a sign that you're right. Be sure it's trouble because of your commitment to Christ. Like I said before, not because we're jerks. And I, I think I've been victim of both, in all honesty. Sometimes I think it is because I'm standing for Jesus. 
And other times it's been because I didn't handle something well and I'm just a jerk. And we want to be sure, though, it's, we're being, that Jesus is being persecuted to us, not we're being persecuted because we are not handling it right. But anyway, in this case, Jeremiah did not have my problem. Jeremiah was doing it exactly right. And he said, I'm saying exactly what you tell me to say, the way you said to say it, and it's misery for me. I, I, I don't even want to talk about you anymore because it doesn't do anything but bring me trouble. But there's a fire that is shut up in my bones. I'm so in sync with you. You're such a part of me that I'm all in. That even when I don't want to talk about you, it happens anyway. Because I don't have to set up and pretend. I can't even stop it now. Have, have you and I got to the point in Christ that if we made a decision, today I will not talk about Jesus. But we do anyway. Because I got news for you, brothers and sisters who may be listening or watching. We do talk about everything we care about uncontrollably. You, ever, you, is, you, ever, you know of anybody that has to talk about their kids? Man, I just really had to put a lot of effort into that. Anybody have to talk about their football team? Anybody have to talk about hunting and fishing? Golf? Whatever, whatever you really love, hopefully your wife if you're married, you can't help it. I've even tried to reel in bragging on my wife so much because I think it may get on people's nerves. I can't stop it. Because I really think she's that awesome. I think she's incredible. Well, I hope I'm the same way about Jesus. And that's what James is saying. Jeremiah never saw his harvest to what? He was in heaven. You know, now God's saying, see now, just be patient. Just do what I said to do. And then trust that the harvest is coming. And you may not see it. Not on this side of heaven. And he says, so I want you to look to the prophets as our example. And then he goes on to bring up the biggie, Job. Whoop, look out, here comes Job. Verse 11 and 12, oh, one of the most disturbing stories in the Bible, if we're honest. One of the most disturbing stories in the Bible. There's certainly a lot of hope there, but there's a part of God in this that we don't like if we were honest. You know, I've even had people try to bypass it. Well, the devil did that to him. Well, you're right, but guess who led him? God. And guess who determined what the devil could and couldn't do? He limited him. Satan even comes back one time and says, I think I'm too limited. Can you ease up on me a little bit? I, I want to I touch him. I, I want to make him miserable. See, the first time he couldn't even make Job miserable physically. He said, I've killed his kids, which, by the way, with the weather. So be careful about looking for signs and wonders too much. Because guess who else can do them? And he says, but yeah, let me put my hand on him. He said, all right, I'm going to draw another line. You can't kill him. He even got, God even decided of his own will. He said, I'm going to give you a little more rope. So you can torture him a little more. Because he's not going to turn on me. And I'm also teaching Job that even though that in, at, the, at, the, at the start of the book of Job, we see that he is a man that is upright and blessed and upright. That was just compared to the other people. What God had to teach him compared to me, though, you're still quite sinful. You're still quite sinful compared to me. Now, compared to the other people and your, and, and your time here on earth, you're doing pretty good. You, you look awesome. But we know that, that Job had to go and pray for his kids a lot. Even his kids weren't really behaving. You know, he, he was constantly having to go make sacrifices on what it sounds like partying that they were doing. And so what Job says after he gets the resume from God is, is, is that I, I love that when, when, when Job is saying, you know, even though he's slaving, I still find my hope only in him. And, and he said, before I'd heard you with my ears, but now I see you. And what he's saying is, hey, Lord, thank you. He, he, and he says, when he sees him, what did he say? He said, so I repent in ashes and dust for compared to you, how sinful I really am. Now, this is a man that, that, that gets a pretty good accolade at the beginning of the chapter, but that was just compared to other people. What Job was showed through his suffering was just how sinful he really still was and how wonderful God was and how merciful and gracious God was even to somebody who was pretty good by earthly standards. Job. But Job is an example, and Jeremiah is an example of what? Steadfast. Even when your wife says, why don't you just curse God and die? 
I mean, can you imagine? I don't like my wife to be against me. It, it, it disrupts my whole life. And that's one of the things Joseph was having to deal with, too. His wife wasn't with him. She was buying into these friends and said, you've done something wrong. You, you must be hiding something. And Joseph's was like, I'm not hiding anything. But then God said, but I'm just showing you who I am and who you are. And, you, and you've, you've passed the test. First Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. You know, in this, you rejoice that for now, for a little while, you may have to be grieved by various trials if necessary. Now, don't miss this, guys, because this is what he's telling the church. You need to get this. This is big. And I, and I had to learn this in a harsh way. And the anniversary of that's coming up Saturday. Is sometimes when you're going through something horrible, you have to get to the point where you are not afraid to say to the Lord, I guess this is necessary to test the genuineness of my faith, to refine me so that I can be trusted that I'm faithful, I'm steadfast. I won't denounce you. And I've noticed in the intimacy of this suffering, I found you to be more wonderful than all my abundance and affluence ever taught me. In this for a little while, you rejoice. You may be grieved by various trials if necessary so that when we pass the test, the test the genius of our faith, it results in what? The glory of Jesus. And James is saying, I know we're getting persecuted, but don't let it ruin you. Be patient and continue to be steadfast and glorify the Lord and look to Job and the other prophets God humbles Job, but then he honors Job. God permits Satan to test us, but he always limits to the extent of the enemy's power. So then he goes on, and this gets kind of weird in verse 12. Why in the world is James throwing in oaths right here? Now, you got us down. We're, we're quiet in the room, James. You've got us all pondering, and all of a sudden you just jump out and you start saying, but above all my brothers do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall into condemnation. Well, that seems to kind of come out of nowhere. Is, is, is Jones some, some random? James just said, oh, by the way, it's almost like he meant to say it earlier, and he's like, oh, 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 I'm wrapping up. I want to talk to you about O's for just a minute. No, let me tell you why it's there. I didn't understand this either, so I, I didn't come up with this. I started studying some of the commentary, and I thought this was beautiful. The reason why James is covering this after suffering is when do we make deals with God? When we're suffering. Hey, be careful when he's got you down. You don't start making all kinds of promises and deals with God. You know, Lord, if you'll just take me out of this, I'll never do this again. I swear. I swear on your name. I'll never do this again. He says, so remember, let this build you to your character. You know why people that always have to swear? It's because they have some kind of reputation that they don't always tell the truth. You can't depend on them. So somebody you can't depend on, like, I know people in this room. It's going to be positive. Don't panic. <laughs> I know people in this room that if they were going out that door and I said, will you go by and, and pick that up for me and take it to Sherry? And they said, yes. They don't have to swear to because I know they're going to do it. But now there would be some people that would say, I'll do it. I swear I will which means you usually don't. So you had to go to a different level to make me think I can depend on you. And what he says is true people of God, if they say yes, it's yes. And if they say no, it's no. And don't get into suffering and start making all kinds of deals and swearing and all this. Just be obedient to the Lord. End of subject. And if somebody says, yes, I'm going to do something, they do it. And if you say no, you don't. End of subject. My people don't need all this other stuff. And that was popular in the Jewish culture for them to do all these oaths and swearing on their mother and all the and you know what James said, look, let's cut all that. Now under the new covenant, the church of Jesus, those of us who are under his authority, we say yes, it's yes, we say no, it's no. That's kind of, that's how you live your life. Is that you? Is that me? I mean, is your word under the authority of Christ? People say, if he said it, it's done. Now, certainly there can be circumstances you didn't count on. I'm just talking about 
You say you're going to do something. How about this? Can I, if you walk out the door right now and look at me and say you're going to pray for me, can I depend on that? Let me tell you something. I know my own weaknesses. If you come to me and say, I need you to pray for me, we're going to pray right now. You know why? Because I don't want to just innocently forget. You know, I'm not going to do that. The yes, sir, knowing that that may not be a given. I'd like for it to be my bond to say I'm going to pray for you, but I really could get caught up in other things today, suddenly get up tomorrow, be driving in and say, oh, my gosh, that interview's already over. I never prayed about that. So I, if I could give you just a pointer from another fallen man who, who, who's, who's working on sanctification, but I haven't arrived yet, if somebody asks you to pray about something and you're standing there, just pray for them right then. You know, but now be the kind of people you know what that yes and no really depends on, too? If you're going off on a business trip and your wife is looking at you as you leave and you say, I'll be faithful to you. I won't watch porn. I won't be going to dinner with that person who's one of our partners or a salesperson. And, and when you leave, she doesn't even worry about it because you've lived such a life under the authority of Christ that if you said that wasn't going to happen, it won't. Now, if you have to stand in the door and start having to swear you're going to do it or not do it, James says, that's usually a flaw in your character. Why are you making such a fuss about it? Just do it. Just be dependable. Just be honest because those under Christ are. Then he rose into a prayer of faith. Let us pray. James 5, 13 through 20 and I love this, and this is, this, is, this is one of the problems, honestly, it, just being honest, especially in the Western church, we're a little bit uncomfortable with, but it looks like this is not a new problem because James is talking about it in the first Christian church in Jerusalem, and that is what do we do with those who are members of the church but they stray into sin? But he's using an example. Why don't we just treat the same way we do the sick and the afflicted? He says this. He says, if anyone among you is suffering, let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the, in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed fervently that it may not rain for three years and six months, and it didn't rain on the earth. But then he turned around and prayed, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore fruit. We all know that story of Elijah. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now, some people are taking this and misusing it in some of the health, wealth, and prosperity stuff. They think James is just talking about being physically sick. And if you get together and you get the elders and you'll anoint them and you'll pray, and if you're true men of faith, this person will be healed from the physical sickness. Certainly that's happened, but it don't happen every time. I do have good news. One of our brothers in here that's struggling with cancer, the doctors are already kind of shocked that they just were ready for the operation to take it out here in the next few days, and they went to check how the tumor's doing, and it's gone. You know? Now, now, does that mean that he's going to live and it's not going to be a problem? I didn't say that. I'm just saying right now doctors went to see if the tumor had been shrunk and they can't find it. Now, they're still going to go in, and there may be stuff they still got to look at in cancerous tissue. I'm not, I'm not declaring some miraculous healing. I'm just telling you that a lot of y'all been praying for this guy, and he's been praying, and he's under the authority of the Lord, but he would, he would praise God's name if they found that the tumor had tripled in size. It's not about that, but I'm just telling you that's one to put here. But this is not really what James is talking about. What he's saying is, how do we treat sick people here? We, we, we try to bring them up. We all try to pray over them. He goes, what I'm using this, though, is an analogy. Why don't we have that same attitude about our brothers or our sisters who are sick in sin? They've wondered from the truth. He even talks about this. They're here in the congregation, and they've wondered from the truth. And he's saying, we pray for the afflicted and the sick. We need to pray for our brothers who wonders. He said, the sinner here, remember, this is a church congregation. He is not talking about the lost. He's talking about that we have people as, as members of our church that claim to have been uh, reconciled back to God and justified in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and they're living in open sin among the congregation. They have wandered from the truth, and he says this is actually worse than a lost person. Why? God doesn't expect lost people to act in any other way than what? Lost. 
But we do know that, the, especially if you look in those letters to, to the church at Corinth, we know in, in 1 Corinthians 11.30, now this is, doesn't mean these people went to hell, but God was so troubled by the confusion and the problem of people in the church congregation living in open sin, he killed them. I, I know a friend of mine who had a daddy who was wild as a buck, and he gave his life to Jesus and was reconciling back to his family and died within the first few weeks of that happening. And I remember him saying to me, he said, God knew my daddy pretty well. It was better go and kill him now. He said, because at that time... You know, he, he said, he said I, I think God really knew my daddy was going to have a hard time sticking, you know, living in this fallen creation in this sinful world. But he, he reconciled himself to God. He asked for forgiveness of his sin. He asked for forgiveness from his family. And then God killed him. And so in this particular case, this has become so erroneous and so detrimental to God's church. See, we always talk about how the sin that somebody's committing, how it affects their family, and we should, how it affects them, and we should. But James says, don't forget also how it affects the church. And sometimes we can be so gracious and wonderful and merciful about this that we're not, we're not taking on. We need to deal with this if we truly love this person and if we love God's church. 1 Corinthians 5. Paul can't believe they're not dealing with this guy who's living in sin. He said, this is what he's doing sexually. It's so heinous that the pagans don't even do this. And what we can gather from what he said, that he was basically sleeping with his daddy's new wife, like with his stepmom. And he's like, the pagans don't do this. And he goes, and y'all are letting this guy just, you, you, you think you're, I'm paraphrasing, but you, you think you're being so gracious by letting this guy just remain in the church body. Hey, the church doors are open for the lost. Please come. They're not claiming anything other than we're lost. But the church deals differently when people said, oh, I'm not lost. I'm one of the church, and they live in open sin. Not stumbles. I'm talking about just defiantly living in open sin, and everybody keeps coming to me and saying, I don't know about this. And they don't change. Hey, there's some more people. Matthew 18. Hey, I don't know about this. And they don't change. He says at one point you got to bring it before the church, and if they don't repent, you got to throw them out. And Paul said, I'm praying. If I could get there, I'd throw him out. He said, but I'm too far away. But I'm I'm praying that that Satan, that God let Satan have him, and that he will take him out of that church body, and that he'll it'll probably save his life. And it also purifies the church body. Now, that doesn't mean we're not gracious. It doesn't mean we're not merciful, and it doesn't mean we're sanctimonious and self-righteous. But there is a moment that we stand on the authority of the church and the authority of Christ, and we don't allow people to go out and confuse people by claiming that somehow they're the member of a church body, but nothing's been changed about them. They live just like the lost world. And I'm not talking about lost people. Neither is the Bible. We can certainly apply this to lost people, But what he's saying here, he says, we need to go out and we need to to take care of the sin that is going on in the church. And he says, and if you bring this person back, you're actually loving them. But you're going to have to say this sin cannot stand according to Scripture. And he said, that that is, don't let this go on because I'm telling you, and and I know you, and we've seen it a thousand times, if we allow open sin to take place among believers, it doesn't mean that, I'm not saying that you know, I'm, not a, I'm not a fall from grace guy that somehow their salvation is in jeopardy. Like I said, I believe the people that, that God killed in Corinth, uh, by all accounts, they probably went to heaven. He just stopped the damage they were doing there in the church. I'm not going to sit there and say that you know, there's some kind of weight that if you got this much sin or whatever. I'm not talking about that. But the, the, the scriptures and James is talking about we must deal with open sin in the church and we can't allow it just to go on because of our love for Christ and our love for them. Because it goes back to the analogy I gave you, and we, we've talked about many times about Lot. I mean, by, all, by all accounts, Lot is in heaven. But the way Lot lived his life in Sodom and Gomorrah cost his wife and his son-in-laws and his daughters greatly. You know, there was some hope for the daughters, but the son-in-law and the wife. And why couldn't they get turned? They looked at Lot and said, well, he said we're all good. Isn't he a man of God? He said, he said we're fine. He didn't have any credibility when he said, let's leave. Why did his wife look back? Because her husband had always acted like Sodom and Gomorrah was great. So see, whether you think your salvation is in jeopardy or not, and I'm not the judge of that, the damage that open sin does for the lost and for the, the credibility of the church is enormous. 
And James is saying, we, we can't take this lightly. He says, we need to be praying a prayer of faith, not just to heal somebody from being physically sick, but what? To heal them from being spiritually sick. We can't allow this to go on inside God's church. And he says, and anyone who brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover, think about this, a multitude of sins. I'm thinking about Ezekiel when I'm thinking about this. I think I could be wrong. It may be in 18. I think it is. In Ezekiel 18, where Ezekiel is saying, look, and he talks about lost people and people that are supposed to be part of, at that time, the chosen people of God. He said, if you go to a person who's living a wicked life and you tell them that it's wickedness and you tell them that God offers justification by faith and they don't do it, then their blood's not on your hand. It's not. That's their, that's their decision. He said, but if they're living in wickedness and you know it and you don't tell them, their blood's going to be on your hand. Well, then you think, okay, well, he's talking about lost people. That's a big responsibility. Understood. No, he goes further. He said, and if you see a believer, if you see one of us that's living in open sin, and you go tell them, hey, this is a problem, and they reject you, and that's not on you. I won't hold that against you. He said, but if you see it and you don't deal with it, I'm going to hold you accountable for the damage in this person's life and the damage they cause because you should have said something. And if we don't do it for any other reason, do it because we're devoted to, 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 the, to our Lord and to our God. And he says, so, so this is important. There's a way to do it. Don't miss it. There's a way to do it. But I think sometimes we're so concerned about not coming off the wrong way, which that's fine, unless you take to the point that you just don't do anything. Here's an idea. Don't just not do it. Concentrate on doing it right. And then if that person, if you do it exactly the way the Bible says to do it, and that person still talks about how mean and evil you are and how sanctimonious and self-righteous you are, let it happen. But at least you can go to the Lord and say, I did what you told me to do, the way you told me to do it. And that, that, that's important. I just had to deal with that myself. And, and I know that I'm probably going to get pummeled on this one. But what I did was right. And the way I did it was right. And if I get pummeled by the person, I don't care. I just don't want to stand before God. And he goes, now I told you how to handle that. And you didn't do it. Now that person... It's called not. It's because when we're talking about in the church, that person doesn't just cause damage to himself or herself. It causes damage to the whole church body. And you want you want to see a church split? You'll probably find open sin was not dealt with in it. Dealt with in it just about every time. So we finished the book of James, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna move into finishing strong by Steve Farrar coming up uh, next week, and then we'll roll through that. Let me close us in prayer. Lord, thank you for these incredible words of, of challenge and conviction from the book of James. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your presence in our lives. And Lord, I pray that everybody within the sound of, of, of the voice today and of the study today, that all of us, if we're being prompted by the Holy Spirit to deal with anything in our lives or in the lives of someone we love or we know, or maybe we've just come to the conclusion today, I don't think, I don't think I'm a member of, of this church you are talking about. I don't, I, don't, I don't know, Jesus. I can't give you a story or see any evidence that I've ever made any move other than believing in Jesus, and I'd like to change that today. And we've covered that all through this book. You just simply say, Lord, I, I, I confess that I'm a sinner. I acknowledge you with my mouth, and I believe in my heart that you are my Lord and Savior. And I repent of my sins, and I turn to you. You know, the Bible says, I don't know the sincerity of anyone's heart, but if you're sincere in your heart, you can be justified by faith and receive God's grace and mercy. If that's happened with you today, you need some help with that, or maybe you've been playing games and you thought that you were a member of, of the church uh, of Jesus Christ and you realized, hey, maybe I'm not. I don't see any evidence of that in my life. Remember, if your life is riddled with sin, if it's just riddled with sin, and you somehow think you're still right with Jesus, that don't say much about Jesus. And I know from firsthand experience that he radically changes lives. And we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Thank you all for being here. Don't forget Man Church next Sunday night.